Chapter thirty nine of That Affair Next Door. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. That Affair Next Door by Anna K. Green. Chapter thirty nine. The Watchful Eye. As I parted with Miss Oliver on Mrs. Desberger's stoop, and did not visit her again in that house, I will introduce the report of a person better situated than myself to observe the girl during the next few days. That the person thus alluded to was a woman in the service of the police is evident, and as such may not meet with your approval, but her words are of interest, as witness. Friday, P.M. Party went out today in company with an elderly female of respectable appearance. Said elderly female wears puffs and moves with great precision. I say this in case her identification should prove necessary. I had been warned that Miss O would probably go out, and as the man set to watch the front door was on duty, I occupied myself during her absence in making a neat little hole in the partitions between our two rooms, so that I should not be obliged to offend my next door neighbor by too frequent visits to her apartment. This done, I awaited her return, which was delayed till it was almost dark. When she did come in, her arms were full of bundles. These she thrust into a bureau drawer, with the exception of one, which she laid with great care under her pillow. I wondered what this one could be, but could get no inkling from its size or shape. Her manner when she took off her hat was fiercer than before, and a strange smile, which I had not previously observed on her lips, added force to her expression. But it paled after supper-time, and she had a restless night. I could hear her walk the floor long after I thought it prudent on my part to retire, and at intervals through the night I was disturbed by her moaning, which was not that of a sick person, but of one very much afflicted in mind. Saturday. Party quiet sits most of the time with hands clasped on her knee before the fire. Given to quick starts as if suddenly awakened from an absorbing train of thought. A pitiful object, especially when seized by terror, as she is at odd times. No walks, no visitors today. Once I heard her speak some words in a strange language, and once she drew herself up before the mirror in an attitude of so much dignity I was surprised at the fine appearance she made. The fire of her eyes at this moment was remarkable. I should not be surprised at any move she might make. Sunday. She has been writing today. But when she had filled several pages of letter paper, she suddenly tore them all up and threw them into the fire. Time seems to drag with her for she goes every few minutes to the window from which a distant church clock is visible, and sighs as she turns away. More writing in the evening, and some tears. But the writing was burned as before, and the tears stopped by a laugh that augurs little good to the person who called it up. The package has been taken from under her pillow and put in some place not visible from my spy-hole. Monday. Party out again today gone some two hours or more. When she returned she sat down before the mirror and began dressing her hair. She has fine hair, and she tried arranging it in several ways. None seemed to satisfy her, and she tore it down again and let it hang till supper-time, when she wound it up in its usual simple knot. Mrs. Desberger spent some minutes with her, but their talk was far from confidential, and therefore uninteresting. I wish people would speak louder when they talk to themselves. Tuesday. Great restlessness on the part of the young person I am watching. No quiet for her, no quiet for me. Yet she accomplishes nothing, and as yet has furnished me no clue to her thoughts. A huge box was brought into the room to-night. It seemed to cause her dread rather than pleasure, for she shrank at the sight of it, and has not yet attempted to open it but her eyes have never left it since it was set down on the floor. It looks like a dressmaker's box, but why such emotion over a gown? Wednesday. 
This morning she opened the box but did not display its contents. I caught one glimpse of a mass of tissue paper, and then she put the cover on again, and for a good half hour sat crouching down beside it, shuddering like one in an ague fit. I began to feel there was something deadly in the box. Her eyes wandered towards it so frequently and with such contradictory looks of dread and savage determination. When she got up, it was to see how many more minutes of the wretched day had passed. Thursday. Party sick. Did not try to leave her bed. Breakfast brought up by Mrs. Desberger, who showed her every attention, but could not prevail upon her to eat. Yet she would not let the tray be taken away, and when she was alone again, or thought herself alone, she let her eyes rest so long on the knife lying across the plate, that I grew nervous and could hardly restrain myself from rushing into the room. But I remembered my instructions and kept still, even when I saw her hand steal towards this possible weapon, though I kept my own on the bell-rope, which fortunately hung at my side. She looked quite capable of wounding herself with the knife, but after balancing it a moment in her hand, she laid it down again and turned with a low moan to the wall. She will not attempt death till she has accomplished what is in her mind. Friday. All is right in the next room. That is, the young lady is up, but there is another change in her appearance since last night. She has grown contemptuous of herself, and indulges in less brooding. But her impatience at the slow passage of time continues, and her interest in the box is even greater than before. She does not open it, however, only looks at it and lays her trembling hand now and then on the cover. Saturday. A blank day, party dull and very quiet. Her eyes begin to look like ghastly hollows in her pale face. She talks to herself continually, but in a low, mechanical way, exceedingly wearing to the listener, especially as no word can be distinguished. Tried to see her in her own room today, but she would not admit me. Sunday. I have noticed from the first a Bible laying on one end of her mantel shelf. Today she noticed it also, and impulsively reached out her hand to take it down. But at the first word she read she gave a low cry, and hastily closed the book and put it back. Later, however, she took it again and read several chapters. The result was a softening in her manner, but she went to bed as flushed and determined as ever. Monday. She has walked the floor all day. She has seen no one and seems scarcely able to contain her impatience. She cannot stand this long. Tuesday. My surprises began in the morning. As soon as her room had been put in order, Miss O. locked the door and began to open her bundles. First she unrolled a pair of white silk stockings, which she carefully but without any show of interest laid on the bed. Then she opened a package containing gloves. They were white also and evidently of the finest quality. Then a lace handkerchief was brought to light, slippers, an evening fan, and a pair of fancy pins. And lastly she opened the mysterious box and took out a dress so rich in quality and of such simple elegance it almost took my breath away. It was white and made of the heaviest satin, and it looked as much out of place in that shabby room as its owner did in the moments of exultation of which I have spoken. Though her face was flushed when she lifted out the gown, it became pale again when she saw it lying across her bed. Indeed, a look of passionate abhorrence characterized her features as she contemplated it, and her hands went up before her eyes, and she reeled back, uttering the first words I have been able to distinguish since I have been on duty. They were violent in character and seemed to tear their way through her lips almost without her volition. It is hate, I feel, nothing but hate. Ah, if it were only duty that animated me. Later she grew calmer, and covering up the whole paraphernalia with a stray sheet she had evidently laid by for the purpose, she sent for Mrs. Desberger. When that lady came in she met her with a wan but by no means dubious smile, 
and ignoring with quiet dignity the very evident curiosity with which that good woman surveyed the bed, she said appealingly, "'You have been so kind to me, Mrs. Desberger, that I am going to tell you a secret. Will it continue to remain a secret, or shall I see it in the faces of all my fellow boarders to-morrow?' You can imagine Mrs. Desberger's reply, also the manner in which it was delivered, but not Miss Oliver's secret. She uttered it in these words. I am going out to-night, Mrs. Desberger. I am going into great society. I am going to attend Miss Althorpe's wedding. Then, as the good woman stammered out some words of surprise and pleasure, she went on to say, I do not want anyone to know it, and I would be so glad if I could slip out of the house without anyone seeing me. I shall need a carriage, but you will get one for me, will you not, and let me know the moment it comes? I am shy of what folks say, and besides, as you know, I am neither happy nor well if I do go to weddings and have new dresses, and— She nearly broke down, but collected herself with wonderful promptitude, and with a coaxing look that made her almost ghastly, so much it seemed out of accord with her strained and unnatural manner. She raised a corner of the sheet, saying, I will show you my gown if you will promise to help me quietly out of the house, which, of course, produced the desired effect upon Mrs. Desberger, that woman's greatest weakness being her love of dress. So from that hour I knew what to expect, and after sending precautionary advices to police headquarters, I set myself to watch her prepare for the evening. I saw her arrange her hair and put on her elegant gown, and was as much startled by the result as if I had not had the least premonition that she only needed rich clothes to look both beautiful and distinguished. The square parcel she had once hidden under her pillow was brought out and laid on the bed, and when Mrs. Desberger's low knock announced the arrival of the carriage, she caught it up and hid it under the cloak she hastily threw about her. Mrs. Desberger came in and put out the light, but before the room sank into darkness, I caught one glimpse of Miss Oliver's face. Its expression was terrible beyond anything I had ever seen on any human countenance. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 As the clock struck I do not attend weddings in general, but great as my suspense was in reference to Miss Oliver, I felt that I could not miss seeing Miss Althorpe married. I had ordered a new dress for the occasion, and was in the best of spirits, as I rode to the church in which the ceremony was to be performed. The excitement of a great social occasion was for once not disagreeable to me, nor did I mind the crowd, though it pushed me about rather uncomfortably, till an usher came to my assistance, and seated me in a pew which, I was happy to see, commanded a fine view of the chancel. I was early, but then I always am early, and having ample opportunity for observation, I noted every fine detail of ornamentation with approval, Miss Althorpe's taste being of that fine order which always falls short of ostentation. Her friends are in very many instances my friends, and it was no small part of my pleasure, to note their well-known faces among the crowd of those that were strange to me. That the scene was brilliant and that silks, satins, and diamonds abounded goes without saying. At last the church was full and the hush which usually precedes the coming of the bride was settling over the whole assemblage when I suddenly observed in the person of a respectable-looking gentleman seated in a side pew the form and features of Mr. Grice, the detective. This was a shock to me, yet what was there in his presence there to alarm me? Might not Miss Althorpe have accorded him this pleasure out of pure goodness of her heart? I did not look at anybody else, however, after once my eyes fell upon him, but continued to watch his expression, which was non-committal, though a little anxious for one engaged in a purely social function. The entrance of the clergyman and the sudden peal of the organ in the well-known wedding march recalled my attention to the occasion itself, and as at that moment the bridegroom stepped from the vestry to await his bride at the altar, 
I was absorbed by his fine appearance and the air of mingled pride and happiness with which he watched the stately approach of the bridal procession. But suddenly there was a stir through the whole glittering assemblage, and the clergyman made a move and the bridegroom gave a start, and the sound, slight as it was, of moving feet grew still, and I saw advancing from the door on the opposite side of the altar a second bride, clad in white and surrounded by a long veil which completely hid her face. A second bride, and the first was halfway up the aisle, and only one bridegroom stood ready. The clergyman, who seemed to have as little command of his faculties as the rest of us, tried to speak. But the approaching woman, upon whom every regard was fixed, forestalled him by an authoritative gesture. Advancing towards the chancel, she took her place on the spot reserved for Miss Althorpe. Silence had filled the church up to this moment, but at this audacious move a solitary wailing cry of mingled astonishment and despair went up behind us. But before any of us could turn, and while my own heart stood still, for I thought I recognized this veiled figure, the woman at the altar raised her hand and pointed towards the bridegroom. "'Why does he hesitate?' she cried. "'Does he not recognize the only woman with whom he dare face God and man at the altar? "'Because I am already his wedded wife, and have been so for five long years, "'does this make my wearing of this veil amiss when he, a husband, unreleased by the law, "'dares enter this sacred place with the hope and expectation of a bridegroom?' "'It was Ruth Oliver who spoke. "'I recognized her voice as I had recognized her apparel but the emotions aroused in me by her presence, and the almost incredible claims she advanced, were lost in the horror inspired by the man she thus vehemently accused. No lost spirit from the pit could have shown a more hideous commingling of the most terrible passions known to man than he did in the face of this terrible arraignment. And if Ella Althorpe, cowering in her shame and misery halfway up the aisle, saw him in all his depravity at that instant as i did nothing could have saved her long-cherished love from immediate death yet he tried to speak it is false he cried all false the woman i once called wife is dead dead olive randolph murderer she exclaimed the blow struck in the dark found another victim and pulling the veil from her face, Ruth Oliver advanced to his side, and laid her trembling hand with a firm and decisive movement on his arm. Was it her words, her touch, or the sound of the clock striking eight in the great tower over our heads, which so totally overwhelmed him? As the last stroke of the hour which was to have seen him united with Miss Althorpe died out in the awed spaces above him, he gave a cry such as i am sure never resounded between those sacred walls before and sank in a heap on the spot where but a few minutes previous he had lifted his head in all the glow and pride of a prospective bridegroom End of chapter forty This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 41 of That Affair Next Door. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. That Affair Next Door by Anna K. Green. Chapter 41. Secret History. It was hours before I found myself able to realize that the scene I had just witnessed had a deeper and much more dreadful significance than appeared to the general eye, and that Ruth Oliver, in her desperate interruption of these treacherous nuptials, had not only made good her prior claim to Randolph Stone as her husband, but had pointed him out to all the world as the villainous author 
of that crime which for so long a time had occupied my own and the public's attention thinking that you may find the same difficulty in grasping this terrible fact and being anxious to save you from the suspense under which i myself labored for so many hours i here subjoin a written statement made by this woman some weeks later in which the whole mystery is explained it is signed olive randolph the name to which she evidently feels herself best entitled the man known in new york city as randolph stone was first seen by me in michigan five years ago his name then was john randolph and how he has since come to add to this further appellation of stone i must leave to himself to explain i was born in michigan myself until my eighteenth year i lived with my father who was a widower without any other child in a little low cottage amid the sand mounds that border the eastern side of the lake i was not pretty but every man who passed me on the beach or in the streets of the little town where we went to market and to church stopped to look at me and this i noticed and from this perhaps my unhappiness arose for before i was old enough to know the difference between poverty and riches i began to lose all interest in my simple home duties and to cast longing looks at the great school building where girls like myself learned to speak like ladies and play the piano yet these ambitious promptings might have come to nothing if i had never met him i might have settled down in my own sphere and lived a useful if unsatisfied life like my mother and my mother's mother before her but fate had reserved me for wretchedness and one day just as i was on the verge of my eighteenth year i saw john randolph i was coming out of church when our eyes first met and i noticed after the first shock my simple heart received from his handsome face and elegant appearance that he was surveying me with that strange look of admiration i had seen before on so many faces and the joy this gave me and the certainty which came with it of my seeing him again made that moment quite unlike any other in my whole life and was the beginning of that passion which has undone me ruined him and brought death and sorrow to many others of more worth than either of us he was not a resident of the town but a passing visitor and his intention had been as he has since told me to leave the place on the following day but the dart which had pierced my breast had not glanced entirely aside from his and he remained as he declared to see what there was in this little country girl's face to make it so unforgettable we met first on the beach and afterwards under the strip of pines which separate our cottage from the sand mounds and though i have no reason to believe he came to these interviews with any honest purpose or deep sincerity of feeling it is certain he exerted all his powers to make them memorable to me and that in doing so he awoke some of the fire in his own breast which he took such wicked pleasure in arousing in mine in fact he soon showed that this was so for i could take no step from the house without encountering him and the one indelible impression remaining to me from those days is the expression his face wore as one sunny afternoon he laid my hand on his arm and drew me away to have a look at the lake booming on the beach below us there was no love in it as i understand love now but the passion which informed it almost amounted to intoxication and if such a passion can be understood between a man already cultivated and a girl who hardly knew how to read it may in a measure account for what followed my father who was no fool and who saw the selfish quality in this attractive lover of mine was alarmed by our growing intimacy taking an opportunity when we were both in a more sensible mood than common he put the case before mr randolph in a very decided way he told him that either he must marry me at once or quit seeing me altogether no delay was to be considered and no compromise allowed as my father was a man with whom no one ever disputed john randolph prepared to leave the town 
declaring that he could marry no one at that stage of his career. But before he could carry out his intention, the old intoxication returned, and he came back in a fever of love and impatience to marry me. Had I been older or more experienced in the ways of the world, I would have known that such passion as this evinced was short-lived, that there is no witchery in a smile lasting enough to make men like him forget the lack of social graces to which they are accustomed. But I was mad with happiness, and was unconscious of any cloud lowering upon our future, till the day of our first separation came when an event occurred which showed me what I might expect if I could not speedily raise myself to his level. We were out walking, and we met a lady who had known Mr. Randolph elsewhere. She was well dressed, which I was not, though I had not realized it till I saw how attractive she looked in quiet colors, and with only a simple ribbon on her hat, and she had besides a way of speaking which made my tones sound harsh, and robbed me of that feeling of superiority with which I had hitherto regarded all the girls of my acquaintance. But it was not her possession of these advantages, keenly as I felt them, which awakened me to the sense of my position. It was the surprise she showed, a surprise the source of which was not to be mistaken, when he introduced me to her as his wife, and though she recovered herself in a moment, and tried to be kind and gracious, I felt the sting of it and saw that he felt it too, and consequently was not at all astonished when, after she had passed us, he turned and looked at me critically for the first time. But his way of showing his dissatisfaction gave me a shock it took me years to recover from. "'Take off that hat,' he cried, and when I had obeyed him he tore out the spray, which to my eyes had been its chief adornment, and threw it in some bushes near by. Then he gave me back the hat, and asked for the silk neckerchief, which I had regarded as the glory of my bridal costume. Giving it to him, I saw him put it in his pocket, and understanding now that he was trying to make me look more like the lady we had passed, I cried out passionately. It is not these things that make the difference, John, but my voice and my way of walking and speaking. Give me money and let me be educated, and then we will see if any other woman can draw your eyes away from me. But he had received a shock that made him cruel. You cannot make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, he sneered, and was silent all the rest of the way home. I was silent too, for I never talk when I am angry, but when we arrived in our own little room I confronted him. "'Are you going to say any more such cruel things to me?' I asked. "'For if you are, I should like you to say them now and be done with it.' He looked desperately angry, but there was yet a little love left in his heart for me, for he laughed after he had looked at me for a minute, and took me in his arms and said some fine things, with which he had previously won my heart, but not with the old fire and not with the old effect upon me. Yet my love had not grown cold, it had only changed from the unthinking stage to the thinking one, and I was quite in earnest when I said, I know I am not as pretty or as nice as the ladies you are accustomed to, but I have a heart that has never known any other passion than its love for you, and from such a heart you ought to expect a lady to grow, and there will. Only give me the chance, John, only let me learn to read and write but he was in an incredulous state of mind, and it ended in his going away without making any arrangements for my education. He was bound for San Francisco, where he had business to transact, and he promised to be back in four weeks, but before the four weeks elapsed, he wrote me that it would be five, and later on that it would be six, and afterwards that it would be when he had finished a big piece of work he was engaged upon and which would bring him a large amount of money. I believed him, and I doubted him at the same time, but I was not altogether sorry he delayed his return, for I had begun school on my own account, and was fast laying the foundation of a solid education. My means came from my father, who, now it was too late, saw the necessity of my improving myself. 
The amount of studying I did that first year was amazing but it was nothing to what I went through the second, for my husband's letters had begun to fail me, and I was forced to work in order to drown grief and keep myself from despair. Finally no letters came at all, and when the second year was over, and I could at least express myself correctly, I woke to the realization that, so far as my husband was concerned, I had gone through all this labor for nothing, and that unless by some fortunate chance I could light upon some clue to his whereabouts, in the great world beyond our little town, I would be likely to pass the remainder of my days in widowhood and desolation. My father dying at this time and leaving me a thousand dollars, I knew no better way of spending it than in the hopeless search I have just mentioned. Accordingly, after his burial, I started out on my travels, gaining experience with every mile. I had not been away a week before I realized what a folly I had indulged in, in ever hoping to see John Randolph back at my side. I saw the homes in which such men as he lived, and met in cars and on steamboats the kind of people with whom he must associate to be happy, and a gulf seemed to open between us, which even such love as mine would be powerless to bridge. But, though my hope thus sank in my breast, I did not lose my old ambition of making myself as worthy of him as circumstances would permit. I read only the best books, and I allowed myself to become acquainted with only the best people, and as I saw myself liked by such, the awkwardness of my manner gradually disappeared, and I began to feel that the day would come when I should be universally recognized as a lady. Meantime, I did not advance an iota in the object of my journey, and at last, with every expectation gone of ever seeing my husband again, I made my way to Toledo. Here I speedily found employment, and what was better still to one of my ambitious tendencies, an opportunity to add to the sum of my accomplishments a knowledge of French and music. The French I learned from the family I lived with, and the music from a professor in the same house whose love for his pet art was so great that he found it simple happiness to impart it to one so greedy for improvement as myself. Here in course of time I also learned typewriting, and it was for the purpose of seeking employment in this capacity that I finally came to New York. This was three months ago. I was in complete ignorance of the city when I entered it, and for a day or two I wandered to and fro, searching for a suitable lodging house. It was while I was on my way to Mrs. Desberger's that I saw advancing toward me a gentleman in whose air and manner I detected a resemblance to the husband who some five years since had deserted me. The shock was too much for my self-control, quaking in every limb, I stood awaiting his approach, and when he came up to me and I saw by his startled recognition of me that it was indeed he, I gave a loud cry and threw myself upon his arm. The start he gave was nothing to the frightful expression which crossed his face at this encounter, but I thought both due to his surprise, though now I am convinced they had their origin in the deepest and worst emotions of which a man is capable. "'John, John!' I cried, and could say no more, for the agitations of five solitary, despairing years were choking me. But he was entirely voiceless, stricken, I have no doubt beyond any power of mine to realize. How could I dream that in consideration, power, and prestige he had advanced even more rapidly than myself, and that at this moment he was not only the idol of society, but on the verge of uniting himself to a woman, I will not say of marrying her, for marry her he could not while I lived, who would make him the envied possessor of millions. Such fortune, such daring, yes, and such depravity, were beyond the reach of my imagination, and while I thought his pleasure less than mine, I did not dream that my existence was a menace to all his hopes and that during this moment of speechlessness he was sounding his nature for means to rid himself of me even at the cost of my life. 
His first movement was to push me away, but I clung to him all the harder, at which his whole manner changed, and he began to make futile efforts to calm me and lead me away from the spot. Seeing that these attempts were unavailing, he turned pale and raised his arm up passionately, but speedily dropped it again, and casting glances this way and that, broke suddenly into a loud laugh, and became, as by the touch of a magician's wand, my old lover again. "'Why, Olive!' he cried. "'Why, Olive, is it you?' Did I say my name was Olive? Happily met, my dear. I did not know what I had been missing all these years, but now I know it was you. Will you come with me, or shall I go home with you? I have no home, said I. I have just come into town. Then I see but one alternative. He smiled, and what a power there was in his smile when he chose to exert it. You must come to my apartments, are you willing? I am your wife, I answered. He had taken me on his arm by this time, and the recoil he made at these words was quite perceptible, but his face still smiled, and I was too mad with joy to be critical. And a very pretty and charming wife you have become, said he, drawing me on for a few steps. Suddenly he paused, and I felt the old shadow fall between us again, but your dress is very shabby, he remarked. It was not. It was not near as shabby as the linen duster he himself wore. Is that rain, he inquired, looking up as a drop or two fell. Yes, it is raining. Very well, let us go into this store we are coming to and buy a gossamer. That will cover up your gown. I cannot take you to my house dressed as you are now. Surprised, for I had thought my dress very neat and ladylike, but never dreaming of questioning his taste any more than in the old days in Michigan, I went with him into the shop he had pointed out, and bought me a gossamer, for which he paid. When he had helped me put it on, and had tied my veil well over my face, he seemed more at ease, and gave me his arm quite cheerfully. Now, said he, you look well, but how about the time when you will have to take the gossamer off? I tell you what it is, my dear. You will have to refit yourself entirely before I shall be satisfied. And again I saw him cast about him that furtive and inquiring look, which would have awakened more surprise in me than it did, had I known that we were in a part of the city where he ran, but little chance of meeting any one he knew. This old duster I have on, he suddenly laughed, is a very appropriate companion to your gossamer and, though I did not agree with him, for my clothes were new, and his old and shabby, I laughed also, and never dreamed of evil. As this garment, which so disfigured him that morning, has been the occasion of much false speculation on the part of those whose business it was to inquire into the crime, with which it is in a most unhappy way connected, I may as well explain here and now, why so fastidious a gentleman as Randolph Stone came to wear it. The gentleman called Howard Van Burnham was not the only person who visited the Van Burnham offices on the morning preceding the murder. Randolph Stone was there also, but he did not see the brothers, for finding them closeted together he decided not to interrupt them. As he was a frequent visitor there his presence created no remark, nor was his departure noted. Descending the stairs separating the offices from the street, he was about to leave the building, when he noticed that the clouds looked ominous. Being dressed for a luncheon with Miss Althorpe, he felt averse to getting wet, so he stepped back into the adjoining hall and began groping for an umbrella in a little closet under the stairs where he had once before found such an article. While doing this he heard the younger Van Burnham descend and go out, and realizing that he could now see Franklin without difficulty, he was about to return upstairs when he heard that gentleman also come down and follow his brother into the street. His first impulse was to join him, but finding nothing but an old duster in the closet, he gave up this intention, and putting on this shabby but protecting garment, started for his apartments little realizing into what a course of duplicity and crime it was destined to lead him. 
for to the wearing of this old duster on this especial morning innocent as the occasion was i attribute john randolph's temptation to murder had he gone out without it he would have taken his usual course up broadway and never met me or even if he had taken the same roundabout way to his apartments as that which led to our encounter he would never have dared in his ordinary fine dress conspicuous as it made him to have entered upon those measures which as he is clever enough to know led to disgrace if they do not end in a felon's cell it was john randolph then or randolph stone as he is pleased to call himself in new york and not franklin van burnham who had doubtless proceeded in another direction who came up to where howard had stood saw the keys he had dropped and put them in his own pocket it was as innocent an action as the donning of the duster and yet it was fraught with the worst consequences to himself and to others being of the same height and complexion as franklin van burnham and both gentlemen wearing at that time a moustache my husband shaved his off after the murder the mistakes which arose out of this strange equipment were but natural seen from the rear or in the semi-darkness of a hotel office they might look alike though to me or to any one studying them well their faces are really very different but to return leading me through streets of which i knew nothing he presently stopped before the entrance of a large hotel i tell you what olive said he we had better go in here take a room and send for such things as you require to make you look like a lady as i had no objection to anything which kept me at his side i told him that whatever suited him suited me and followed him quite eagerly into the office i did not know then that this hotel was a second-rate one not having had experience with the best but if i had i should not have wondered at his choice for there was nothing in his appearance as i have already intimated or in his manners up to this point to lead me to think he was one of the city's great swells and that it was only in such an unfashionable house as this he would be likely to pass unrecognized how with his markedly handsome features and distinguished bearing he managed to so carry himself as to look like a man of inferior breeding i can no more explain than i can the singular change which took place in him when once he found himself in the midst of the crowd which lounged about this office from a man to attract all eyes he became at once a man to attract none and slouched and looked so ordinary that i stared at him in astonishment little thinking that he had assumed this manner as a disguise seeing me at a loss he spoke up quite peremptorily let us keep our secret olive till you can appear in the world full-fledged and look here darling won't you go to the desk and ask for a room i am no hand at any such business confounded at a proposition so unexpected but too much under the spell of my feelings to dispute his wishes i faltered out but supposing they ask me to register at which he gave me a look which recalled the old days in michigan and quietly sneered give them a fictitious name you have learned to write by this time have you not stung by his taunt but more in love with him than ever for his momentary display of passion had made him look both masterful and handsome i went up to the desk to do his bidding a room said i and when asked to write our names in the book that lay before me i put down the first that suggested itself i wrote with my gloves on which was why the writing looked so queer that it was taken for a disguised hand this done he rejoined me and we went upstairs and i was too happy to be in his company again to wonder at his peculiarities or weigh the consequences of the implicit confidence i accorded him i was desperately in love once more and entered into every plan he proposed without a thought beyond the joyous present he was so handsome without his hat and when after some short delay he threw aside the duster i felt myself for the first time in my life in the presence of a finished gentleman then his manner was so changed he was so like his oldest and best self 
so dangerously like what he was in those long vanished hours under the pines in my sand-swept home on the shores of lake michigan that he faltered at times and sank into strange spells of silence which had something in them that made my breath come fitfully did not awaken my apprehension or rouse in me more than a passing curiosity i thought he regretted the past and when after one such pause in our conversation he drew out of his pocket a couple of keys tied together with a string and surveyed the card attached to them with a strange look easy enough to be understood by me now i only laughed at his abstraction and indulged him in a fresh caress to make him more mindful of my presence these keys were the ones which mrs van burnham's husband had dropped and which he had picked up before meeting me and after he had put them back into his pocket he became more talkative than before and more systematically lover-like i think he had not seen his way clearly until that moment the dark and dreadful way which was to end as he supposed in my death but i feared nothing suspected nothing such deep and desperate wickedness as he was planning was beyond the wildest flight of my imagination when he insisted upon sending for a complete set of clothing for me and when at his dictation i wrote a list of the articles i wanted i thought he was influenced by his wish as my husband to see me dressed in articles of his own buying that it was all a plot to rob me of my identity could not strike such a mind as mine and when the packages came and were received by him in the sly way already known to the public i saw nothing in his caution but a playful display of mystery that was to end in my romantic establishment in a home of love and luxury this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 41, Part 2 of That Affair Next Door. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. That Affair Next Door by Anna K. Green, Chapter 41. Part Two, Secret History. Or rather, it is thus that I account for my conduct now, and yet the precaution I took not to change the shoes in which my money was hidden may argue that I was not without some underlying doubt of his complete sincerity. But if so, I hid it from myself, and as I have every reason to believe, from him also doubtless excusing my action to myself by considering that i would be none the worse off for a few dollars of my own even if he was my husband and had promised me no end of pleasure and comfort that he did intend to make me happy he had assured me more than once indeed before we had been long in this hotel room he informed me that great experiences lay before me that he had prospered much in the last five years and had now a house of his own to offer me and a large circle of friends to make our life in it agreeable we will go to our house to-night said he i have not been living in it lately and you may find it a little uncomfortable but we will remedy that to-morrow anything is better than staying here under a false name and i cannot take you to my bachelor apartment I had doubted some of his previous statements, but this one I implicitly believed. Why should not so elegant a man have a house of his own? And if he had told me it was built of marble and hung with Florentine tapestries, I should still have credited it all. I was in fairyland and he was my knight of romance. Even when he had hung his head in leaving the hotel and looked at once so ordinary and uninteresting. The ruse he made use of to cut off all connection between ourselves and Mr. and Mrs. James Pope, who had registered at the Hotel D, was accepted by me with the same lack of suspicion. That he should wish to carry no remembrance of our old life into our new home, I thought a delightful piece of folly, 
and when he proposed that we should bequeath my gossamer and his own disfiguring duster to the coachman in whose half we were riding i laughed gleefully and helped him fold them up and place them under the cushions though i did wonder why he cut a piece out of the neck of the former and pouted with the happy freedom of a self-confident woman when he said it is the first thing i ever bought for you and i am foolish enough to wish to preserve this much of it for a keepsake do you object my dear as i was conscious of cherishing a similar folly in his regard and could have pressed even that old duster of his to my heart i offered him a kiss and said no and he put the scrap away in his pocket that it was the portion on which was stamped the name of the firm from which it was bought did not occur to me when the coach stopped he urged me away on foot in a direction entirely strange to me saying we would take another hack as soon as we had disposed of the bundles we were carrying how he intended to do this i did not know but presently he drew me towards a chinese laundry where he bade me leave one of them as washing and the other he dropped before the opening of a sewer as we stepped up a neighboring curbstone and still i did not suspect our ride to gramercy park was short but during it he had time to put a bill in my hand and tell me i was to pay the driver he had also time to secure the weapon upon which he had probably had his eye fixed from the first his manner of doing this i can never forgive for it was a lover's manner and as such intended to deceive and conjole me drawing my head down on his shoulder he drew off my veil saying that it was the only article left of my buying and that we would leave it behind us in this coach as we left the gossamer in the other only i will make sure that no other woman ever wears it he laughed slitting it up and down with his knife when this was done he kissed me and then while my heart was tender and the warm tears stood in my eyes he drew out the pin from my hat meeting my remonstrances with the assurance that he hated to see my head covered and that no hat was as pretty as my own brown hair as this was nonsense and as the coach was beginning to stop i shook my head at him and put my hat on but he had dropped the pin or so he said and i had to alight without it when i had paid the driver and the coach had driven off i had a chance to look up at the house before which we had stopped its height and imposing appearance daunted me in spite of the great expectations i had formed and i ran up the stoop after him in a condition of mingled awe and wild delight that was the poorest preparation possible for what lay before me in the dark interior we were entering he was fumbling nervously in the keyhole with his key and i heard a whispered oath escape him but presently the door fell back and we stepped into what looked to me like a cavern of darkness do not be frightened he admonished me i will strike a light in a moment and after carefully closing the street door behind us he stretched out his hand to take mine or so i judge for i heard him whisper impatiently where are you i was on the threshold of the parlor to which i had groped my way while he was closing the front door so i whispered back here but found voice for nothing further for at that instant i heard a sound proceeding from the depths of the darkness in front of me and was so struck with terror that i fell back against the staircase just as he passed me and entered the room from which that stealthy noise had issued darling he whispered darling and went stumbling on in the void of darkness before me till suddenly by some power i cannot explain i seemed to see faintly but distinctly as if with my mind's eye rather than with my bodily one i perceived the shadowy form of a woman standing in the space before him and beheld him suddenly grasp her with what he meant to be a loving cry but which to my ears at that moment sounded strangely ferocious and after holding her a moment suddenly released her at which she uttered one low curdling moan and sank at his feet at the same instant i heard a click which i did not understand then 
but which I now know to have been the head of the hat-pin striking the register. Horrified past all power of speech and action, for I saw that he had intended this blow for me, I cowered against the stairs waiting for him to pass out. This he did not do at once, though the delay must have been short. He stopped long enough by the prostrate form to stir it with his foot, probably to see if life was extinct, but no longer, yet it seemed an eternity before I perceived him groping his way over the threshold, an eternity in which every act of my life passed before me, and every word and every expression with which he had beguiled me came to rack my soul and made the horror of this mad awakening greater. No thought of her, or of the guilt with which he had forever damned his soul, came to me in that first moment of misery. My loss, my escape, and the danger in which I still stood, if the least hint reached him of the mistake he had made, filled my mind too entirely for me to dwell on any less impersonal theme. His words, for he muttered several in that short passage out, showed me in what a fool's paradise I had been reveling, and how certainly I had turned his every thought towards murder when I seized him in the street and proclaimed myself his wife. The satisfaction with which he uttered, well struck, gave little hint of remorse, and the gloating delight with which he added something about the devil having assisted him to make it a safe blow as well as a deadly one, was proof not only of his having used all his cunning in planning this crime, but of his pleasure in its apparent success. That he continued in this frame of mind, and that he never lost confidence in the precautions he had taken, and in the mystery with which the deed was surrounded, is apparent from the fact that he revisited the Van Burnham office on the following morning, and hung again on its accustomed nail, the keys of the Gramercy Park house. When the front door had closed, and I knew that he had gone away, in the full belief that it was my form he had left lying behind him on that midnight floor, all the accumulated terrors of the situation came to me in full force, and I began to think of her as well as of myself, and longed for courage to approach her, or even the daring to call out for help. But the thought that it was my husband who had committed this crime held me tongue-tied, and though I soon began to move inch by inch in her direction, it was some time before I could so far overcome my terror as to enter the room where she lay. I had supposed, and still supposed, as was natural after seeing him open the door with the keys he took from his pocket, that the house was his, and the victim a member of his own household. But when, after innumerable hesitations, and a bodily shrinking that was little short of torment, I managed to drag myself into the room and light a match, which I found on a farther mantel-shelf, I saw enough in the general appearance of the rooms, and of the figure at my feet, to make me doubt the truth of both these suppositions. Yet no other explanation came to lighten the mystery of the occasion, and dazed as I was by the horror of my position, and the mortal dread I felt of the man who in one instant had turned the heaven of my love into a hell of fathomless horrors, I soon had eyes for the one fact only, that the woman lying before me was sufficiently like myself to inspire me with the hope of preserving my secret, and keeping from my would-be slayer the knowledge of my having escaped the doom he had prepared for me. For ascribe it to what motive you will, that was the one idea now dominating my mind. I wanted him to believe me dead. I wanted to feel that all connection between us was severed for ever. He had killed me. By killing my love and faith in him, he had murdered the better part of myself and I shrank with inconceivable horror from anything that would bring me again under his eye, or force me to assert claims that it would be the future business of my life to forget. When the first match went out, I had not the courage to light another, so I crept away in the darkness to listen at the foot of the stairs. 
There was no sound from above, and a terrifying sense began to pervade me that I was in that house alone. Yet there was safety in the thought, and opportunity for what I was planning. And finally, under the stress of the purpose that was every moment developing within me, I went softly upstairs and listened at all the doors, till I was certain that the house was unoccupied. Then I came down and walked resolutely back into the parlor, for I knew if I allowed any time to pass, I could never again summon up strength to cross its grisly threshold. Yet I did nothing for hours but crouch in one of its dismal corners, waiting for morning. That I did not go mad in that awful interval is a wonder. I must have been near it more than once. I have been asked, and Miss Butterworth has been asked, how in the light of what we now know concerning this poor victim's present there we account for her being in the darkness and showing so little terror at our entrance and Mr. Stone's approach. I account for it in this way. Two half-burned matches were found in the parlor grate. One I flung there, and the other had probably been used by her to light the dining-room gas. If this was still lighted when we drove up, as it may have been, then, alarmed by the sound of the stopping coach, she had put it out, with a vague idea of hiding herself, till she knew whether it was the old gentleman who was coming, or only her suspicious and unreasonable husband. If it was not lighted then, she was probably aroused from a sleep on the parlor sofa, and was for the moment too dazed to cry out, or resent an embrace she had not time to understand, before she succumbed to the cruel stab that killed her. Miss Butterworth, however, thinks the poor creature took the intruder for Franklin till she heard my voice, when she probably became so amazed that she was in a measure paralyzed and found it impossible to move or cry out. As Miss Butterworth is a woman of great discretion, I should think her explanation the truest if I did not consider her a little prejudiced against Mrs. Van Burnham. But to return to myself, with the first glimmer of light that came through the closed shutters, I rose and began my dreadful task, upheld by a purpose as relentless as that which drove the author of this horror into murder. I stripped the body and put upon it my own clothing, with the one exception of the shoes. Then, when I had redressed myself in hers, I steadied up my heart, and with one wild pull dragged down the cabinet upon her, so that her face might lose its traits and her identification become impossible. How I had the strength to do this, and how I could contemplate the result without shrieking, I cannot now imagine. Perhaps I was hardly human at this crisis. Perhaps something of the demon which had informed him in his awful work had entered into my breast, making this thing possible. I only know that I did what I have said, and I did it calmly. More than that, that I had mind and judgment left to give to my own appearance. Observing that the dress I had put on was of a conspicuous plaid, I exchanged the skirt portion with the brown silk petticoat under it and when I observed that it hung below the other, as of course it would, I went through the house till I came upon some pins, with which I pinned it up out of sight. Thus equipped, I was still a person to attract attention, especially as I had no hat to put on, my own having fallen from my head, and been covered by the dead woman's body, which nothing would induce me to move again. But I had confidence in my own powers to escape question, toned up as I was in every nerve by the dreadfulness of my situation, and as soon as I was in decent shape for flight, I opened the front door and prepared to slip out. But here the intense dread I felt of my husband, a dread which had actuated all my movements, and sustained me in as harrowing a task as ever woman performed, seized me with renewed force and I quailed at the prospect of entering the streets alone. Supposing he should be on the stoop! Supposing he should be in an opposite window, even! Could I encounter him again and live? He was not far away, or so I felt. 
A murderer, it is said, cannot help haunting the scene of his crime, and if he should see me alive and well, what might I not expect from his astonishment and alarm? I did not dare go out. But neither did I dare remain, so after quaking for a good five minutes on the threshold, I made one wild dash through the door. There was no one in sight, and I reached Broadway before I ran across man or woman. Even then I got by without anyone speaking to me, and, favored by Providence, found a nook at the end of an alleyway where I remained undiscovered till it was late enough in the morning for me to enter a shop and buy a hat. The rest of my movements are known. I found my way to Mrs. Desberger's this time without interruption, and from that place sought and found a situation with Miss Althorpe. That her fate was in any way connected with mine, or that the Randolph Stone she was engaged to marry was the John Randolph from whose clutches I had just escaped, was of course unsuspected by me, and, incredible as it may seem, continued to be unsuspected as long as I remained in the house. There was reason for this. My duties were such as I could well attend to in my own room, and feeling a horror of the world and everything in it, I kept my room as much as possible, and never went out of it when I knew that he was in the house. The very thought of love awakened intolerable emotions in me, and much as I admired and revered Miss Althorpe, I could not bring myself to meet or even talk of the man to whom she was in expectation of being so soon united. There was another thing of which I was ignorant, and that was the circumstances which had invested with so much interest the crime of which I had been witness. I did not know that the victim had been recognized, or that an innocent man had been arrested for her murder. In fact, I knew nothing concerning the affair, save what I had seen with my own eyes, no one having mentioned the murder in my presence, and I having religiously avoided the very sight of a paper, for fear that I should see some account of the horrible affair, and so lose what small remnants of courage I still possessed. This apathy concerning a matter so important to myself, or rather, this almost frenzied determination to cut myself loose from my dreadful past may seem strange and unnatural, but it will seem stranger yet when I say that for all these efforts I was haunted night and day by one small fact connected with this past which made forgetfulness impossible. I had taken the rings from the hands of the dead woman as I had taken away her clothes, and the possession of these valuables, probably because they represented so much money, weighed on my conscience and made me feel like a thief. The purse which I found in a pocket of the skirt I had put on was a trouble to me, but the rings were a source of constant terror and disturbance. I hid them finally in a ball of yarn I was using, but even then I experienced but little peace, for they were not mine and I lacked the courage to avow it, or seek out the person to whom they now rightfully belonged. When, therefore, in the intervals of fever which attacked me in Miss Althorpe's house, I overheard enough of a conversation between her and Miss Butterworth to learn that the murdered woman had been a Mrs. Van Burnham, and that her husband or relatives had an office somewhere downtown. I was so seized by the instinct of restitution that I took the first opportunity that offered to leave my bed and hunt up these people. That I would injure them in any way by secretly restoring these jewels, I never dreamed. Indeed, I did not exercise my mind at all on the subject, but only followed the instincts of my delirium. And while to all appearance I showed all the cunning of an insane person, in the pursuit of my purpose, I fail to remember now how I found my way to Duane Street, or by what suggestion of my diseased brain I was induced to slip these rings upon the hook attached to Mr. Van Burnham's desk. Probably the mere utterance of this well-known name into the ears of passers-by was enough to obtain for me such directions as I needed, but, however that may be, 
the result was misapprehension and the complications which followed serious of the emotion caused in me by the unaccountable discovery of my connection with this crime i need not speak the love which i had one time felt for john randolph had turned to gall and bitterness but enough sense of duty remained in my bruised and broken heart to keep me from denouncing him to the police till by a sudden stroke of fate or providence i saw him in the carriage with miss althorpe and realized that he was not only the man with whom she was upon the point of allying herself but that it was to preserve his place in her regard and to attain the lofty position promised by this union he had attempted to murder me and had murdered another woman only less unfortunate and miserable than myself it was the last and bitterest blow that could come from his hand and though instinct led me to throw myself into the carriage before which i stood and thus escape a meeting which i felt i could never survive i was determined from that moment not only to save miss althorpe from an alliance with this villain but to revenge myself upon him in some never-to-be-forgotten manner that this revenge involved her in a public shame from which her angelic goodness to me should have saved her i regret now as deeply as even she can wish but the madness that was upon me made me blind to every other consideration than that of the boundless hatred i bore for him and while i can look for no forgiveness from her on that account i still hope the day will come when she will see that in spite of my momentary disregard for her feelings i cherish for her an affection that nothing can efface or make other than the ruling passion of my life End of chapter forty one chapter forty two with miss butterworth's compliments they tell me that mr gryce has never been quite the same man since the clearing up of this mystery that his confidence in his own powers is shaken and that he hints more often than is agreeable to his superiors that when a man has passed his seventy-seventh year it is time for him to give up active connection with police matters i do not agree with him his mistakes if we may call them such were not those of failing faculties but of a man made over secure in his own conclusions by a series of old successes had he listened to me but i will not pursue this suggestion you will accuse me of egotism an imputation i cannot bear with equanimity and will not risk modest depreciation of myself being one of the chief attributes of my character footnote d my attention has been called to the fact that i have not confessed whether it was owing to a mistake made by mr gryce or myself that franklin van burnam was identified as the man who had entered the adjoining house on the night of the murder well the truth is neither of us was to blame for that the man i identified it was while watching the guests who attended mrs van burnham's funeral you remember was really mr stone but owing to the fact that this latter gentleman had lingered in the vestibule till he was joined by franklin and that they had finally entered together some confusion was created in the mind of the man on duty in the hall so that when mr gryce asked him who it was that came in immediately after the four who arrived together he answered mr franklin van burnam being anxious to win his superior's applause and considering that person much more likely to merit the detective's attention than a mere friend of the family like mr stone in punishment for this momentary display of egotism he has been discharged from the force i believe a b end of footnote d howard van burnam bore his release as he had his arrest with great outward composure mr gryce's explanation of his motives in perjuring himself before the coroner was correct and while the mass of people wondered at that instinct of pride 
which led him to risk the imputation of murder sooner than have the world accuse his wife of an unwomanly action there were others who understood his peculiarities and thought his conduct quite in keeping with what they knew of his warped and oversensitive nature that he has been greatly moved by the unmerited fate of his weak but unfortunate wife is evident from the sincerity with which he still mourns her i had always understood that franklin had never been told of the peril in which his good name had stood for a few short hours but since a certain confidential conversation which took place between us one evening i have come to the conclusion that the police were not so reticent as they made themselves out to be in that conversation he professed to thank me for certain good offices i had done him and his and waxing warm in his gratitude confessed that without my interference he would have found himself in a strait of no ordinary seriousness for said he there has been no overstatement of the feelings i cherished toward my sister-in-law nor was there any mistake in thinking that she uttered some very desperate threats against me during the visit she paid me at my office on that monday but i never thought of ridding myself of her in any way i only thought of keeping her and my brother apart till i could escape the country when therefore he came into the office on tuesday morning for the keys of our father's house i felt such a dread of the two meeting there that i left immediately after my brother for the place where she had told me she would await a final message from me i hoped to move her by one final plea for i love my brother sincerely notwithstanding the wrong i once did him i was therefore with her in another place at the very time i was thought to be with her at the hotel d a fact which greatly hampered me as you can see when i was requested by the police to give an account of how i spent that day when i left her it was to seek my brother she had told me of her deliberate intention of spending the night in the gramercy park house and as i saw no way of her doing this without my brother's connivance i started in search of him meaning to stick to him when i found him and keep him away from her till that night was over i was not successful in my undertaking he was locked in his rooms it seemed packing up his effects for flight we always had the same instinct even when boys and receiving no answer to my knock i hastened away to gramercy park to keep a watch over the house against my brother coming there this was early in the evening and for hours afterwards i wandered like a restless spirit in and out of those streets meeting no one i knew not even my brother though he was wandering about in very much the same manner and with very much the same apprehensions the duplicity of the woman became very evident to me the next morning in my last interview with her she had shown no relenting in her purpose towards me but when i entered my office after this restless night in the streets i found lying on my desk her little handbag which had been sent down from mrs parker's in it was the letter just as you divined miss butterworth i had hardly got over the shock of this most unexpected good fortune when the news came that a woman had been found dead in my father's house what was i to think that it was she of course and that my brother had been the man to let her in there miss butterworth this is how he ended i make no demands upon you as i have made no demands upon the police to keep the secret contained in that letter from my much abused brother or rather it is too late now to keep it for i have told him all there was to tell myself and he has seen fit to overlook my fault and to regard me with even more affection than he did before this dreadful tragedy came to harrow up our lives do you wonder i like franklin van burnham the misses van burnham call upon me regularly and when they say dear old thing now they mean it of miss althorpe i cannot trust myself to speak she was and is the finest woman i know and when the great shadow now hanging over her 
has lost some of its impenetrability, she will be a useful one again, or I do not rightly read the patient smile which makes her face so beautiful in its sadness. Olive Randolph has, at my request, taken up her abode in my house. The charm which she seems to have exerted over others, she has exerted over me, and I doubt if I shall ever wish to part with her again. In return she gives me an affection which I am now getting old enough to appreciate. Her feeling for me and her gratitude to Miss Althorpe are the only treasures left her out of the wreck of her life, and it shall be my business to make them lasting ones. The fate of Randolph Stone is too well known for me to enlarge upon it, but before I bid farewell to his name I must say that after that curt confession of his, yes, I did it, in the way and for the motive she alleged, I have often tried to imagine the contradictory feelings with which he must have listened to the facts as they came out at the inquest. And convinced, as he had every reason to be, that the victim was his wife, heard his friend Howard not only accept her for his, but insist that he was the man who accompanied her to the house of death. He has never lifted the veil from those hours, and he never will. But I would give much of the peace of mind which has lately come to me, to know what his sensations were, not only at that time, but when, on the evening after the murder, he opened the papers and read that the woman, whom he had left for dead with her brain pierced by a hat-pin, had been found on that same floor, crushed under a fallen cabinet, and what explanation he was ever able to make to himself for a fact so inexplicable. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.